Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the hosts and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have a problem with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios, transmitting across the internet, this is episode 111 of Registry Matters. Larry, it's 111. Um, were you born in the year 111? That was actually very, very close. Huh. You've been alive uh, for uh, yeah. that long? Well, I've been trying to find the exact stone they chiseled it into so I can be, be certain, but it's 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 worn through all the years, so we're we're thinking it might be in, in that in that zone there, but I'm not sure of the exact year. So when Moses was bringing the tablets down, I heard he had fifteen commandments. You tripped him and one of them broke, and that's how it ended up to just be ten, so it's your fault? I guess so, yes. <laughs> Do we have any late breaking news that we need to cover before we dive into what's going on with all of the hot topics for tonight? I don't have any late breaking news that's juicy that we would want to uh, cover like we normally do. I, I do have something to share with you. Um, we we had a guest on the podcast, uh, I don't know, three months ago, an attorney. And uh, I just saw his co-host post something on Twitter that he would like for his kids to watch a program called Cosmos that National Geographic has picked up for a second season. And the person that hosts this uh during the summertime, maybe, maybe it was even a year ago, got accused of sexual misconduct and, and all that Me Too movement type stuff. And they delayed production of the showing and releasing of the show and why they conducted an internal investigation. So he's like, man, I would really like my kids to watch this program, but because this creepy dude is the one hosting it, do we have any other astrophysicists in the world that haven't done creepy things? He, they just did an internal investigation and they said, hey, you know, we didn't find anything that we could pursue. So they moved everything back to where it was. And I'm just so very bothered by where's the due process. And I'm sure we're going to have some articles in here tonight about that. But why is it so hard to like, why can't we just accept that you have to then bring forth evidence? You can't just say this person accused me, therefore you're guilty. And now you're a piece of crap and, and go home. Well. Wow. I don't understand what's complicated about it. The The desire is to have more convictions and to make these uh, alleged victims whole. And these pesky, pesky things called due process, they, it's just an impediment. Hmm. They know what they did. And, and uh, again, I think we was in the last podcast when I talked about the governor or the podcast before, the last episode, or the was one before where I talked about yeah. where the, where, where the governor uh, New Mexico got to break all the rules, and she got to re-victimize the poor accuser. And, but we we just can't have that, Andy. We've got to get these people made whole. The quicker we get these perps off the street, the sooner these people can begin to heal. And I don't know why you don't understand that. I guess I'm just not wired or smart enough to. Uh, all right. Well. 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 What's well, what's complicated about it? Well. Um, so we have something that's called eighth amendment. You have life, liberty and pursuit of happiness and all that stuff and due process and not getting locked in a cage and all that stuff without all of those protections. So if someone just accuses you and you have your whole life ruined because of an accusation. I'm not saying we shouldn't believe that the, the victim has some sort of evidence to uh, present. I just don't think that we should throw everybody under the bus just because there's an allegation. Well, let's just let's just explore a little intellectual honesty here because I've pontificated for many of the 110 previous episodes about <laughs> the importance of how difficult it should be and how the founders intended it to be difficult to put people in cages. And that it was better that uh, guilty go free than innocent be incarcerated. You've heard that over and over again. Yep. Well, let's, let's, let's examine that because the founders, when it comes to impeaching a president, they did the same thing. They created a very, very, very difficult process to impeach a president. They did not want the whims of the people to come along and have buyer's remorse about someone they had duly elected and put in the high office. So I'm just wondering if that same principle applies to the accusers of the president. The process is designed to be when you, were, when you have to go through a two-step process of going through the House, which is the people's house, and then you have to go through the Senate, which at the time the founders uh, founded the, the country, the senators were not even elected directly by the people, but you have to have a two-thirds majority 
to, to, to remove a president from office. I would say the same principle ought to apply to this. And, and everybody knows I'm no Trump fan. But yeah, I, I do agree. respect due, due, due process of law. And, and, and until the evidence is overwhelming, this president gets to occupy the office. Certainly, because, you know, 60, whatever, oh, sorry, was it 60? Yeah, 60 million people put him in office, so that's what the will of the people was. I, I get that it should be hard to remove him. I totally get it. So, so you, you buy into the same notion that, that, that I buy into about it should be hard to put people in cages, and it should be hard to remove a president, and it is hard if this president will not be removed from office. Yeah. Not by, he may be, may be removed by the voters, which is not looking very likely, but he won't be removed by this process. And I think everyone that's following it to any degree realizes that. And I think, I don't know if we touched on it on the podcast. It, it does feel scuzzy to me that the leader of the Senate comes out and says, well, I'm going to work with the president's defense team to make sure this just, you know, moves through and we can just almost like file a motion to, to, to squash it. I don't remember what the terms were. That sounds scuzzy to me. It, it may, in fact, sound scuzzy, but the, the, we weren't given a lot of guidance in terms of how these processes were. To, to this, this process is actually two processes. It's the step one of the, of the impeachment articles being adopted, which is, uh, closely resembles an indictment, and the step two of a trial. But we didn't get the kind of, we didn't get the kind of guidance from the founding fathers. It might have been hot in Philadelphia, and they might have been trying to get out of there. <laughs> and and they, they, they might have not uh, thought this through carefully. This may have been the end of a, of, a, of, a, of a long journey. But they didn't tell us that evidence is required. They didn't tell us that evidence can be excluded. They didn't tell us anything other than like with a with a regular guilt or innocence, uh, they I think they gave us some guidance in terms of the unanimity unanimity of the jury verdicts, and I don't know how the couple states that weren't doing that got away with it, but but we certainly the jury of of of, of citizens uh, of the, of the person the accused peers, but in in this process we did not re- get a lot of guidance in terms of how to do it. So as I have said on this podcast multiple times, elections have consequences. The people who are in the majority make the rules. So the Pelosi crowd made the rules in the House, and the McConnell crowd get to make the rules in the Senate. One one tiny little caveat that I will put in there. We've both found our, uh, clips. Uh, you found a Lindsey Graham one, and I found a, a McConnell one. Back in the uh, Clinton impeachment, they were like, well, we need to see, we need to hear from witnesses. We need all of these things. And now they're like, well, we don't need to see any of this stuff. I mean, I guess you could say it's two different uh two different presidents, two different situations. So you would apply different rule sets. But at the time they said they wanted evidence and now they're like, we need to move on. Well, you need to play that uh, less dramatic. So, so we can say what that is. Oh, so I should play play that right now. For you to come back and call bigots, my admirers is a farce. It's a act of hypocrisy. It's, it's, It's a terrible way to treat a guest on your show. And you know it. Hypocrisy. So, so, uh, so Mitch, and Lindsay are both being hypocritical. And at the time they made those quotes, they did not realize it was early. It was 20, a little over 20 years ago. They did not realize that those quotes would be so easily retrievable at the time. You wouldn't, you wouldn't <laughs> have been thinking. You wouldn't have been thinking along those lines. What you would have been thinking is that, well, the, the major networks, which we only had three in CNN in those times, I don't think that, uh, I don't even think Fox was on the air in 98. It would have been very uh, close to it. It in that ballpark, yeah. Uh, uh, but but they, they would have they would have been thinking that they could say that was with with uh, a, a straight face, and no one would play it back later. But they did say that they did say witnesses were necessary. But it's one of the many hypocritical things that goes on in the world of politics. Again, the voters of those two states can hold those two. Mitch happens to be up for re-election this year. They can hold him accountable if that hypocrisy bothers them. It doesn't, in my view. I suspect that he'll win re-election from the state of Kentucky. And and to to take on that tiny little detour, my understanding is he's one of the most unpopular senators in the uh, chamber. Well, it's wonder. I, I don't know how we could come to that conclusion. How does he manage to get the votes together to be the majority leader? How does he do that if he's so unpopular? Yeah, I I I'm, I under, I just understand that in his state he has something of like thirty or something percent uh, uh, popularity, whatever. Um, but apparently. Nobody that runs against him is any more popular, so you just win. Well, well, now you're talking about within the chamber of his colleagues. He's unpopular no, within I'm the state of Kentucky. Kentucky. I'm talking about Kentucky. Yeah, 
well, uh, six years ago, who was popular enough to win the ele- re-election. Totally understand. I just that is my understanding, and I could be wrong, but I just think I've heard in passing that he is a ridiculously unpopular senator in his state. But again, well, didn't they say the same? Didn't they say that about Ted Cruz when he just won re-election in two thousand eighteen in Texas? Uh, I didn't hear, but running that could against. Be. Yeah, yeah, uh, he managed. He managed to get be, be reelected against the guy who was running for president. His name's escaping me at the moment. Moment, uh, Beto, Beto O'Rourke, or maybe it's Beto O'Rourke. I guess it's Beto O'Rourke. So, but yes, there, there was, there was, there was some hypocrisy there. Yes, <laughs> there seems to be a lot of it. All right, I'm for reforming our criminal justice system. Too many people are locked up in America. Well, the first one uh, comes from the Guardian. And U.S. states moved to stop prisons charging inmates for reading and video calls. I can't fathom, Larry, how, I mean, one of the, the, the things that we would want in the United States is for people to read more. Anything. I don't care what it is. They should read more and more and more. And we should perhaps pay them to read. But no, in prisons, we're going to charge them, what is it, four cents a minute to read, I think it says. This is asinine. It's crazy. Oh, it's five cents a minute. Unbelievable. Well, I just don't understand. We've got the hardworking taxpayers out there trying to make a living, paying taxes to get their kids educated, and there's no free lunch for them. And you want... That's the problem with liberals is they always think there's a free lunch that they want to just hand out money. And, you know, somebody's got to pay the cost of this technology. Somebody's got to pay for this. I mean, why not let the inmates pay for it? Why do I have to tax the hardworking citizens of, of, of this state when these people are – we're already feeding them. We're taking care of their medical care. We're already doing all these things. And then you want to mollycoddle them more with a computer. What is it next that you're going to want? Well, I think that uh, we should – uh, restrict them from having contact visits or at least in-person visits. And we should move everything to a really shitty voice chat system that kind of cuts out and breaks up all the time too. It's not even the quality that you and I are using for free here. Now it is much, much lower. I think that would be better. It, well, that's exactly where the article in this podcast later is going to, going to talk about that, but, but that's where it's, I don't know how to, to address it because it's a reflection of the voters. And there's 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 voter apathy towards making life better for prisoners behind the walls. We're already getting we're already been they've they've raped and pillaged and plundered society and we're having to take care of them already. And then you just want to drive up the cost more and more. I mean, what what next? I mean, <laughs> where's it in with you with you uh, liberals? The, the, the point that I would also like to drive home there, and I totally know that you're just like playing devil's advocate, is the long-term aspect out of that. If someone reads, they are probably going to be more informed and it will just improve their overall roundedness of their character. So it's almost like we should pay them to read. And actually, that reminds me, I recall as a kid, like the girl that lived across the street from me, she was a super brainiac and she would go around and she would do some sort of a pledge drive, whatever. Hey, if I read X number of books, will you give me a dollar book, $5 a book, whatever. And she would read 20 books in the summertime and we would pay her to read, you know, and she would donate it to some charity or some, you know, whatever uh, organization she was involved in at school. But we should probably encourage instead of set up barriers for people reading as much as we possibly can, because you can educate yourself while reading. You talk about it all the time of, when was the last time someone picked up a rag and, you know, learned something on a weekend or something like that instead of watching a football game or going to Hooters? Gee, did I say that? I've heard you say it. Maybe you haven't said it publicly, but you certainly have said something similar to me. So, well, I do find, I do find these things problematic, but try to look at it from the prison administration side. They're being squeezed also. Uh, prison, prison administrators have been squeezed for all the things that they have to be responsible for that have been largely delegated and dumped on prisons. You know, the opioid crisis, they all end up in prison. They all don't end up in prison. But the, the mentally ill people, they I mean, so many of those are in prison. And prisons have gotten more and more expensive to operate. And very, it's the very rare jail administrator, prison administrator, that actually has control over who comes in. They're usually sent there. 
uh, courts send them there and impose these sentences. These sentences are reflective of the will of the people. So the present administration is in a predicament where, where there's a constant need for more and more funding. And they're looking for revenue angles all the time, you know, having, having uh, engaged in conversations with corrections officials. That's the battle they're always fighting and looking for ways to, to, to offset cost and offload cost and try, trying to, trying to fund the operations. Cause when you go to legislators looking for more money for institutions, that's just not really high on the priority list for, for funding. It's just not, let's see, I'm going to find, I've got an old VHS tape if it hasn't degraded where the uh, uh, director of Minnesota prisons was interviewed back in the 80s, and he was talking about, we have a good, he says, we have a good prison system here. He said, but you don't go out and campaign on having a good prison system and win votes on it. He said, because that's just not a, a vote getter. He said, you do it because it's the right thing to do. And and as prison administrators are constantly squeezed, they're looking for this, and this is, they sit in their staff meetings and come up with these well, we can raise some money this way, and uh, and the cynical would think, well, of course they're putting it in their pocket. But I don't, I don't look at everything with such cynicism. I, I suspect the financial pressures are driving some of these decisions. That doesn't make them the right decisions, but I suspect financial pressures are driving some of this motivation to charge inmates for everything. And and just to cover one last little piece before we move on, though, is who's the 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 one that bears the most burden? A friend of mine, while I was gone, his family was able. And believe me, it did not dent their budget at all. He would actually get money put on multiple people's books so he could spend more than the $50 a week on store goods. It, it wouldn't matter to him for him to spend $4, four cents a minute reading, but you got somebody else that's just shy of, of, of indigent. And, you know, the, the burden is totally on their family that mom's trying to put 10 or 20 bucks a month on his books that, you know, she's scraping by to, to as it is. That, that's not fair to them. It certainly isn't. Now, my curiosity kicks in when you make a statement like that because I have this thirst for knowledge and I want to know. So I haven't been in prison, so I would like to know when you're running money through uh, other people's books because you, you've, you're you spending in excess of what you're allowed to, that can trigger an examination to wonder if that inmate's being exploited. And then I'm wondering what is what is the typical handling fee? So, for example, if if, <laughs> if you wanted fifty dollars fifty dollars put on your books, and you have someone do that, what would a typical handling fee, be based on your experience, be? Because somebody's going to the person who's going to be the diversion for that money. To I mean, a you have to trust them to make sure they don't spend it on themselves. But b what's what's their cut? I want to say I remember something of either ten or twenty percent. So somebody might get ten dollars a store for that 50 bucks. Yeah. And someone in, in chat says it's 20%. So yeah. So for 50 bucks, you'd 20%. Spend, yeah, you'd get $10 a store call and give them 40 bucks. Uh-huh. Well, that's good information to have. So, so you have to be affluent enough to have extra funds available. And then you have to be willing to give up uh, approximately 20% of the, of the revenue so that you can do, so you can funnel that. Just for some stupid zoom zooms and wham whams and cinnamon rolls and soups, man. I mean, like that's how this dude, made it like I, like seriously mate they serve food it is not great food or good food even and you need all of that extra carbs and garbage stuff but that's that's what he did so well the, further down the article it said that those who read slower it could mean inmates could be charged 18 to 12 to 18 dollars for a 200 page book that's now garbage, that's funny man. that's garbage garbage <laughs> and, and i mean you know again god i really don't want to stay on this one that long but all you can do in there is they're warehousing you what else are you supposed to do so it's like the the easiest thing, you want people to stay out of trouble. You don't want people slamming dominoes because that pisses some people off. You don't want people jamming on the TV because that pisses some people off. Like the only thing that you can do that will not piss everyone off is read. And they're, they're, they're squeezing that to make it so that you, you can't do that in private. And now you're having your time to read restricted. That's so, garbage. Well, it is. All right. Well, then we should move over to the Philadelphia Inquirer where... My probation office is not a fun place to be. This one looks like it's a freaking party. What's going on with this well, one at uh, Philadelphia? I was fascinated by this because those who listen to the podcast know that, I, uh, that through the episodes, I've talked about probation should be a helping hand. And it should be a helping hand, not with looking for ways to send you to incarceration. It should be ways to motivate you, to inspire you, and to equip you to succeed. 
And it appears that that's what they're doing in this liberal bastion of Philadelphia. And they're having good results, if you're to believe this story. It that, can't be. This has got to be fake news. It's got to be. Yeah, because nothing like this could work. But it says it seems to be working. In New York City, around 80% of people on probation complete it successfully. In Philadelphia, 49% do so. Uh, the shift began in 2010 when the predecessor, and I can't pronounce any of these names, but uh, <laughs> the, the, they... <laughs> I, can you pronounce? Can you pronounce that, Sheraldi? I guess that's the closest I could come. Sheraldi was hired to run the city's probation department, and and probation. You should not fear your PO. Now, your PO is not supposed to let you do anything and everything you want to do. Your PO is supposed to guide you and move you towards a law-abiding life and equip you for the challenges of society. Because the PO, as a representative of society would want you to succeed because you're going to devour a lot fewer resources if you're paying taxes and working. So therefore, my job is to help you succeed. I mean, that is not a complicated formula. It isn't, but look, I, I'm, I'm sure I have shared this before. There's a friend of mine in Augusta. He gets out, he maxes out, he does 10 years, and he goes to treatment, which I know isn't probation, but goes to a treatment class and coming up around the Christmas time season. So it was probably like four years ago last month. And that person says, I need you to take your, 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 your maintenance polygraph. And he says, I don't have the money for it. And she goes, okay, that's fine. I will drop you from class, which will be a probation violation, which then you'll get revoked. And then you get to go back and visit your, your best friends in your cell block. Like that, that doesn't make that- sense to me. So he title pawned his car so he could afford to pay for uh, the poly. Uh, and that that's a story that you hear all too frequently uh, uh, that, that that this happens now of course they're a business and they they don't I mean they're good capitalists there they don't want to carry unpaid people so again if society were were serious about wanting to to rehabilitate these people society would make sure that if that treatment has any value that it continues and I know people are going to say, well, Larry, don't you understand? If they do that, then nobody would pay and the whole system would come crumbling down because everybody would be looking for it for free. And that may be the, what we need to do is that treatment that's helping a person rehabilitate might should be free. Maybe that's the discussion we need to have. And then there's the other side of that argument. If you have, make it for free, do people value it if, if you provide it for free? That's an age-old debate about something. Is, does it, is it appreciated and valued if, if, there's, if there's nothing, if there's no sacrifice to it? I don't have the answer to that either. Um, I, I'm but sure. Did, that, uh, yeah, but you would, find, you would find cases on both sides that someone would appreciate it. You would also probably even like a one-to-one. All the people that actually appreciate it are the same number of people that actually would just take complete advantage of it. And then you have everybody in between. That is probably the typical. So... I did find the statistic I was looking for. A byproduct is violations fell by 50, 45% over five years uh, uh, and, uh, on this experiment of, of liberal do-goodism. And, uh, uh, and they're trying to, trying to move the same experiment to Philadelphia. But, uh, but this, is, this is what probation should be about, is I'm here to help you succeed. Should we have like a weekend picnics with our POs? I don't know that we'd have wicked picnics with appeals, but <laughs> but helping pe- helping people to understand uh, the most basic skills that people need. Often, people in the criminal justice system do not have those skills. Absolutely, and and I understand people are going to say, "Well, Larry, don't you get it?" That's the parents' job to teach those, but the parents failed. And we can't when they when they reach adulthood and they don't have those skills. I guess we could say, oh, yes, your parents failed. You 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 didn't pick the right birth canal, so therefore we give up on you. But that's not <laughs> the life. That's that's not that's not what I want to see in my society. I want my society, or my country, to help people who didn't win the lottery and who did have parents who failed them. I want those people to be supported and helped with training and resources so that they can work a 50-year career and be prosperous and successful. That's to our advantage. They need to be paying taxes, as Lindsey Graham said when when he championed the First Step Act. He said these people need to be out working, paying taxes. I rarely agree with him, but I agree with him on that. Can you back up back in your day? Did you get to pick your birth canal? 
Yes, yes. Uh, you, okay, you so, get, so somewhere yeah. in there, that plan, that uh, program got shut down because I didn't get to pick anything. Well, but they, they used to do that. You pick, oh, you pick who you want to be born, the country and, and the parents. And, and yeah, I, mean, I don't know what, why this surprises you. Oh, all right then. Hey, well, let's go back over to The Guardian, which happens to be not a U.S.-oriented. Uh, I mean, I guess they have a bureau here because there's a podcast that I listen to that there's a guy from The, from the Guardian. But he is from Wales or something like that. He's got a thick accent. The hidden scandal of U.S. criminal justice, rural incarceration has boomed. So apparently where you have really low uh, population centers out there in the sticks, I'm sure almost all of New Mexico is like this. They, uh, they build up jails so, A, they can house them all there. And then it's a boom for jobs, too. This uh, also seems like kind of a, like, we shouldn't incarcerate people to fill a quota because of a job's need. That seems like the, a, a very perverse incentive system. Well, it's not quite as simplistic as what this article paints the picture of. What happens uh, uh, in real life is you have is you have uh, a, a, a constantly expanding need for for spaces, and urban areas are very expensive and very difficult to build spaces. When you when you when you go into an urban setting, if you're gonna if you're gonna put a correctional facility, it's very difficult. I mean, think about that. Look at your Georgia uh, Department of Corrections. Can you name the number of facilities that are in Atlanta proper that belong uh, uh, owned and operated by the Georgia Department of Corrections? Like in the metro, now, area? probably no, no, it, no, in Atlanta proper, in Atlanta yeah, itself. Can you? Uh, how many are in the city of Atlanta? Basically none. I mean, there might be uh, one so, or two, but very little. Well, so so what you run into is the problem of you need space because society through their elected representatives have have decreed that. People receive hefty prison sentences, and you have a constant flow in and need for space. And you have rural land available where people have largely abandoned these rural areas, and the migration over the last several decades has been away from rural areas. If you look at the population shift, you don't see Sumter County growing. You see Sumter County shrinking in Georgia, and you see uh, uh, Fulton, DeKalb, Clayton, Cobb, and and Gwinnett, and Newton, and, and all those counties closer to the metro, you see them growing. And, and and what 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 you need when you have a dying rural area is something to make people want to stay there. So what happens is land is cheap, labor is plentiful, and you end up with a correctional setting there. Uh, so states build their prisons there, and then the counties also realize that there's money to be made because the states are generally chronically short of space, and they're looking for ways to enhance their budget because they don't like to tax their declining population anyway. So they look to build, well, let's say we have a we have need for 80 beds a day to take care of our population. Let's build a 350-person facility. And we can sell those spaces to the federal family, which includes immigration, customs, uh, uh, ICE. We can sell them to the BOP. We can sell them to the marshal service. And we can sell them to, 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 to state prison. And, and we can sell them to surrounding counties. So you end up with it becomes a, a tool of economic development. And, and so you end up with a major employer in a dying county with, that employs the people that are left there that want to work. That's what happens. Let, let me ask you this question. <laughs> And um, so th- there's a lot of stuff in the news about, well, you can't do this kind of tax. Or you can't do that kind of tax because that's wealth redistribution. Isn't this a form of wealth redistribution? Uh, well, I'll answer that simply. Everything is wealth redistribution. The system, the, the any system you, 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 you devise is wealth redistribution. And wealth di- redistribution is okay depending on which way it's being distributed. And I'm on my soapbox now, but but if the people of the conservative persuasion are on the receiving end of wealth distribution, they're fine. It's only when they're on the giving end that they have problems with it. And I've talked about essential air service that's subsidized for rural areas. They're fine with that wealth redistribution. Uh, I talked about uh, 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 rural telephone service where they actually used to string up lines. The, the conservatives were just fine with that wealth redistribution. When, when I talk about postal services being closed because of the, the, the high cost of running uh, postal delivery, they're just fine with that wealth redistribution. I mean, we can go on and on with rural electrification. We can, we can go on and on. 
they're fine with that wealth redistribution. But when you start redistributing the other way, where you start subsidizing things that are going to primarily urban dwellers, then they have a real problem with that. But yes, this is wealth redistribution. These are these are state facilities being built in a rural area that are bringing millions of taxpayer dollars and jobs to a rural area that's helping those economies flourish. And, and, and that's, that's the reality of it. But, but like I say, everything's wealth redistribution. It just depends on which side of, if you're on the receiving end of it, you're fine with it. If you're on the giving side where you're getting less wealth than what you're paying out, then you have a problem with it. Hmm. Is this another one of those hypocrisies? This is definitely a hypocrisy. <laughs> Is that going to be the title of this particular show is going to be Hypocrisy? Uh, no, no, our transcription is how is he going to deal with, with this word hypocrisy that's going to pick, uh, uh, pop up several times? How is, how is the automated transcriber going to transcribe that word as we, pronounce it, as we keep mispronouncing it? I don't know. Maybe it'll be like H-Y-I-pocrisy. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Maybe it'll be something that has to be fixed throughout the whole program because of hypocrisy. But yes, wealth redistribution is a sore spot for people, and, and uh, you know, as the uh, as the uh, as the wealth has been over the last generation, been more and more centralized and fewer and fewer people. We've had a mass wealth redistribution, but it's been in favor of the haves more than the have-nots. The uh, the middle class has largely stagnated, and and in, and and in reality, may have even gone backwards. I haven't studied those numbers close enough to see what a middle class wage in 1992 would be equal to today to see if they've in fact gone back backwards. But I can say that they've stagnated. That the growth, when you adjust for inflation since 92, has been uh, has been negligible in terms of uh, middle class income growth. But in terms of the executives and the and the and the higher level management, uh, the, the elites, their their income has grown exponentially, exponentially in, in the last 25 years. Um, and then there's an article from the Associated Press that New Mexico jails ban on-site visits offers video chats. Sweet. And they show a picture of a little boy talking to his mom on what looks to be a very crappy little screen. And like, she's not in the frame very well. She might be too short to, and maybe she can't adjust it. I don't know what's going on on the inside of the walls. Uh, you know, so the other thing that, that seems to be the point or seems to be a very important point is to bring someone out of prison the most important thing, and maybe it's not the most important thing, is to have family support to be connected back out there so that you would be incentivized. You would have a reason to not go out and redo your criminal activity. So maybe we should let families visit. Maybe they could hold hands on top of the table. I know people do nefarious things in visitation, but I think that having this little boy hugging his mom saying, Mom, I miss you. I sure hope that you go on the straight and narrow when you get out so we can be together and be a family. But Nope, they got him on a video screen. That looks like garbage. Well, let's be clear. This is the San Juan County Detention Center, which is the the, the county jail for uh, for uh, the, the far northwest four corners area of the state. And they didn't have contact visits to begin with. They they were visiting through the uh, through the glass through the telephone. Sure. But now they don't they don't take them to the booths anymore to the glass. They 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 do it without without them actually entering the facility because. Entering the facility to get to that uh, secure location where they could talk behind the glass, uh, according to the jail administrators, offered too many opportunities for contraband to enter the facility. So now, so now we're going to make it more convenient. They don't even have to travel; they can do it from the comfort of their own home. And, does it even uh, say that it, in there? Because I mean, this picture does not. I mean, he is totally there in a prison-oriented environment to do that. Uh, that video chat. Well, the way it was reported in the news here was that that they were going to make it available to 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 people would not have to travel. But, okay. But uh, I don't know if they're actually going to people that don't have a setup at home. There'd be some people who wouldn't have to set up. Maybe they'd have to come to the jail to do it because they did. They, and they, and that'd be a good thing to charge them for that also. Oh, certainly I mean, have another to revenue stream. That. Sweet. Yeah. So that would make sense. Well, let me let me share this other story. So when I first started my little adventure, uh, my kid is brought in. And he is like propped up. He was 15 or 16 months at the time, just a tiny little dude, you know, still big fat diaper on big head, all that. And he sees me sitting across the glass and all he could do was like, he was just banging on the glass, trying to like, dude, like you're, I can't get to you. Like, this is heart wrenching. It is garbage, 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 garbage that we treat people this way. Well, again, if the voters of San Juan County did not want that, they could clearly communicate that to the, 
county officials and the county commission could step in and say, Sheriff, we really don't want you to run the jail that way. And if the sheriff flipped the bird, the voters are going to get a chance to, to uh, decide whether he should stay in office. So it's not as if there's not remedies, but as far as I'm aware of, there's been no real pushback. The the citizens are just fine with it because it's going to make the security uh, easier and it's going to make uh, uh, less contraband and it's going to keep everybody safe. Sweet. Like we should we should move everything that way. We should probably we should institute so like a no contact policy just in society. We shouldn't have I any contact might, with my, humans, period. I think you might be onto something here. There, there's a, there's actually a movie where they uh, explore that as as part of the uh, fundamental theme. It's called uh, I want to say that's the uh, Demolition Man with uh, Sylvester Stallone and uh, Wesley. Uh, gosh, what's a uh, God? I can't think of his name. Anyway, like the whole premise of the movie is there is no swapping of fluids. That can't has have been, that. Yeah, I know. So, anywho. And it really isn't about what Harvey has to convince me of. It's about what the evidence has convinced me of. So that is the attorney represent one of the attorneys representing Mr. Weinstein is Donna Rotuno Rotuno. And there was an interview that I found with her on Fox news. And she was like, it doesn't, you know, I have seen like the evidence presented to me. He is, he should be found innocent in a courtroom because mm-hmm. there's not enough to uh, go through. So this is a, couple articles out of the New York times uh, profiling the, uh, the attorney. And then there's another one profiling about him trying to move to a new campus because people like on the jury are already trying to sell book rights and things like that. So, well, I appreciate when I read the story, I, I, I should have saved the quotes, but she says some stuff very similar to what I say. And she can get away with saying it because uh, being female, she doesn't have the same standard of being a chauvinist, uncaring guy. But she actually believes that evidence should be required to convict a person. I mean, evidence. imagine that. Evidence? She. Uh, <laughs> Can you tell me what the definition of this word evidence is? Because I don't know that I've ever heard this word before. Yeah, she, she she's she's under the belief that, uh, that, that that there should be evidence, and uh, so I I think it's a I think it's a good good article, and I'm glad that she, that he she is on his team. We need a fair trial. We need evidence, and we don't need people who who are not a part of this case to be allowed to testify. But which is what's going to happen? You know, they're going to the four hundred four B evidence is going to come in galore. But but uh, uh, that that that'll sink anybody's ship. There's another there's another quote in there. It says it's sad. She said that men have to worry about being complimentary and pleasant to a woman. That's a very chauvinist thing to say. Why would why would a man have to worry about that? As long as he says something that isn't sexual, you can compliment a woman. Yeah, I, I, yeah, but then everybody has their own lines on where where you would cross between like, "Hey, nice ass," which obviously would be offensive. But if you say, "Hey, your hair looks nice today," well, would you say that to a man? Like, ah, so then you end up to be sexist. And ah, this well, is this is incredibly challenging times. Apparently, she's only lost one case of a of a of a client named DeMarco Whitley, a 19-year-old football player who was convicted of raping a 50-year-old girl and sentenced to 16 years. I bet you uh, she charges a few hundred dollars an hour. I bet she's not cheap. So, but she deserves it. She, I she gets agree. results. Yep. So, uh, but but that's why I put it in here. Just that it's, it's kind of an anomaly to have someone mimicking what I believe saying it publicly and not fearing of all the backlash that she's going to, I'm sure she gets hate mail. I'm sure she's getting some backlash, but she's saying what needs to be said. The Fox news uh, thing that I got that clip from seemed like the, I don't know who it was that was interviewing her. She was not friendly with her. She it was, it was definitely a tough interview for it, uh, for her because she was almost, you know, attacking her saying, well, how do you, uh, you know, how how do you explain that you know these meetings took place and she's like i'm not saying that the meetings didn't take place and i'm not saying that there wasn't sex i'm saying that the woman went into the room with she wasn't like strapped down and forced to do things that may have or may not have occurred so there's some level of complicity and then you can't have a buyer's remorse after the fact i am not trying to litigate all those points and send all the hate mail to me which is crackpot at registrymatters.co <laughs> that's your email address by the way larry and uh so i 
it's just incredibly challenging and troubling to me how you are supposed to defend yourself against all of those allegations and accusations. Well, she she talks about the Constitution, you know, the fundamental uh, right presumption of innocence. We can't, you know, we can't have uh, movements that strip us of fundamental rights. Now, people professed great belief in that document, but yet they've willingly stood by and said yes at every step of the way. They've. It's kind of like when they interview a sex offender, they always say, aren't you responsible for this predicament where all these unconstitutional things are being imposed on Every sex offender I've ever seen that's on the registry has always said yes. And every person who's interviewed should say, no, I'm not responsible for unconstitutional laws. And we should have been saying a long time ago when people say that that we're re-victimizing these people when they when they have to be cross-examined, we should be saying, no, that's not what we're doing. That's the fundamental design of an adversarial system. That is precisely what the system was supposed to do. There's no victimization here. It's unpleasant. You're trying to put a person in a cage. And before we can let you put that person in a cage, we have to examine your allegations and your evidence, and it's your burden, state, to carry. It's not their burden to carry anything anywhere. It's your burden, prosecutor. It's your burden, accuser, to carry the day with evidence, not emotion, evidence. And one thing to add to that would be not mob rule either. That is correct. It is it's supposed to be evidence. It's not supposed to be a mob. We have mob. This is a mob scene going on with Weinstein. He's not going to get anything that approximates a, a fair trial. I mean, did you see the way that Los Angeles indicted him as his trial was about to get underway? I mean, that that's all intended. I can't. I don't have any evidence, which I require, because that was a coordinated thing between the two prosecution offices. But it certainly is possible that that that. Because there was some discussion. And if even if there was not any discussion, this is a terrible thing to do. Let the person get their trial in New York. See what happens. He may get life without parole. And then you don't even need to spend a penny of your of your community's money because he'll never walk uh, free again. That was He's all. He's already like 70 years old, too. Right. But I'm saying the L.A. prosecutor didn't have any reason to need to file charges on the eve of trial. They did that because it's hot in the news and they got themselves on the news and possibly coordination. But like I said, I don't have any evidence. So I'm only just saying possibly because I would require evidence to, to, to go beyond saying that, that, that this is a conspiracy. We have no evidence of that. I do understand. Well, next up, we have a couple articles that are related to, which I, to me, I'm just super duper fascinated by it. One of them is from a Microsoft blog and the other well, one. We had another Weinstein Day. article here also. Well, we kind of we know, we, we'll go back to it, but we touched on it because uh, he's trying to 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 move the uh, he's trying to move yeah, the case trying, to a different place. Yes, he was asking for a change of venue, which is uh, to move the the trial out of the location, and uh, th- th- that's likely to go nowhere. Uh, it's very very hard to get a change of venue, and uh, the burden is on the person moving for the change of venue. There's no presumption of of anything. You have to come in with evidence to show why you can't get a fair trial, which it costs money to come to that evidence. You've got to come in with surveys and questionnaires and evidence, and it's a very expensive thing. A trial like this would be very costly to move because all of a sudden, if you set up downstate or upstate or whatever they call it outside of New York, if you set this trial up, you've got to carry all the players to that location, the judge, the bailiff, the prosecution team, the defense team. You've got a, and you've got a, a trial that's going to run for weeks. And so it just, just very unlikely that they're going to get a change of venue. But that, that was the other article here is that, that he wants a change of venue, which is likely to be denied. Don't you think that the judge would have already put some sort of gag order on there? There's a, there's a quote in there that says last week, another potential juror posted a message on Twitter asking if anyone could help him leverage his jury service to promote his new novel, a witty black comedy he wrote. I, isn't that like unkosher? Well, sure it is, but these are human beings, and they have desires to make money and to be famous, and to uh, so you're, we're going to be dealing with flawed, mortal human beings, and, and they're going to say that they're not biased because they, they're people who want to sit on this jury. This means a lot to, to to folks. If you sit on this jury, 
you're going to be sought after for a long, long time. I assume that this trial will go on for months and months and months. I'm assuming it's going to be several weeks. I don't know if it's going to be months and months, but it's not going to be a, a, a two-day trial. And those people potentially are, you know, you got to go ask for a time off of work and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, there's going to be a circus around your house as they find out who the individuals are that are on the jury. Well, that's why we give them numbers and we don't, we don't let out who they are until after the fact. So they won't, they, I mean, I can't say that leakage won't occur. But the intent is not to, for the jurors to be revealed while they're while they're while they're uh, impaneled on this case or any case. So, but, so I mean uh, that message there, you totally know who it is. If the person's posting on Twitter asking for any help, I mean he's not just juror number one hundred one saying that on Twitter. I assume. Well, is this a seated juror that's already been been seated for the trial? I guess it says potential juror. I guess. Yeah, so, well, that's that 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 juror wouldn't have been seated. Okay, so he may have a. Uh, screwed the pooch is that the expression he's already already been already been excused all right then is there anything else that i missed then by that one no that's good skynet has become self-aware so we, we can move over to my favorite thing of technology and a couple articles one from microsoft and another one from engadget talking about microsoft shares the new technique to address online grooming of children for sexual purposes and i'm just super interested in this because of it being technology that they're using artificial intelligence to look at the chat history of people to determine if they are acting in a predatory way as an adult to a child, which I think is super interesting. But it does seem that it would be also hard as how do you learn what is predatory without the actual outcome of it being predatory? You could have, you know, like risky chat or something like that, but that's not necessarily predatory. Until you actually cross the line. You'd have to have some sort of well, threshold for it to learn what that line is. Well, I'm not a guru about tech, but I'm assuming, uh, well, I'm far from a guru, but I'm assuming that, that, there, that, there are, uh, that their ability exists out there to monitor chat conversations in real time. I've heard that anyway. Yeah. So if a person, if a person says, I'm 14, and you say, how would you like to meet up? <laughs> at the at the at the at the uh, at the you know, what is the Starbucks or where people are where or wherever you'd meet a fourteen year old, wouldn't that if if you had an algorithm that could pick that up, wouldn't that be predatory behavior? That might be, but potentially so, you know, since you you you've already like slam dunked the ball on that one, start scaling things back to where you know there's there's significantly more nuance and things move significantly slower in how somebody might try to communicate with a with a minor of you know where do you where does the line get crossed that that triggers a thing but and and also the other th- we to to push this back into your realm larry of where you would be the expert where does it cross the line of it being uh s- something that would interest the da well when there's a law broken that's where it, that's where it should cross the law well, uh, should the uh, da be interested uh is it against the law in most states for an adult to meet up with a fourteen-year-old at Starbucks? Probably not. So and there wouldn't that be a that, that, that would not be, a, wouldn't that be. Yeah, I mean that would unto itself be predatory. Uh, it, it probably would move there because a thirty-year-old has not a lot of business to be with a fourteen-year-old. But well, uh, you would, uh, uh, and and this day you would have to prove you could meet that burden if you could prove that the purpose of the meeting at the Starbucks was to engage in an illicit sexual activity. It would be a violation of, of the law. But if you never mentioned sex and you said you wanted to talk about uh, the resignation of President Nixon and you had a, 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 a person who had great interest in civics and you wanted to meet at the Starbucks, there would be no crime. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but now uh- you surprised me. You surprised me because you're the big believer in technology being the solution to all problems, and and we can have the computer sentence everybody. We don't need human beings. So now here it is. We're trying to use the technology to do great things to try to try to derail predatory behavior, and now you're having doubts. Now I'm confused. Don't be confused. There are things that I think it. This could. I, I wouldn't. So uh, we get a lot of pushback from people that think that. All of our people should be allowed to run around willy-nilly on Facebook and Facebook being a, not privately, a publicly held company, but they're not a, they're not a government entity that they can or cannot shut down people's accounts. 
I am of the opinion that they can, if they so choose, if you break their terms of service, same thing with YouTube, same thing with Twitter. So if Microsoft decides to deploy a technology within their platform that says you have crossed the lines of do- by these behaviors, they just shut you off of their platform. It doesn't necessarily cross the line of being anything criminal. So that you're just, you're just uh, accepting their terms of service and they say you shouldn't do anything that would be inappropriate with uh, someone under the age, depending on your local laws may vary, blah, blah, blah. This is just a tool for them to help police their system from people being assholes. Okay, so now I'm more confused. Are you are you for it or, or against it? I'm interested in technology, so therefore I'm for it. But as depending on, on where this goes, I'm definitely against the facial recognition stuff being used by police. But this being within Microsoft's platform, if they then turn these things over to the DA, I probably would have a problem with that unless someone actually then goes and does something nasty. But that's a crime after the fact, which all crime would be after the fact, wouldn't it? There's no crimes before the fact. Well, if you turn something over to the DA, theoretically, if there's if there has a, if the line hasn't been crossed, at the most, the DA could talk to to, to the police and say, "Would you go out and do a knock? Uh, what they call it, a, a knock and chat or a knock and talk?" There'd be nothing to prosecute. I keep telling people when they say that they want to get all this treatment, but they can't get any treatment because of the report rules. And I tell them, until you cross the line, until you've broken the law, you can get all the treatment you want. Is you cannot go in and get all the treatment that you want after you've crossed the line. So if the DA turns over, I mean, the, if Microsoft turns over stuff to the DA and there hasn't been, the line hasn't been crossed, there could be no prosecution legitimately if, if, if someone hasn't gone over the line of what's lawful behavior. Meeting the kid 14 to talk about President Nixon at Starbucks, it would be hard. <laughs> I mean, you would... You could possibly say contributing to the delinquency of a minor because that's a very broadly written statute in most states. And probably most parents would not want their 14-year-old to go meet with a 35-year-old at the Starbucks to talk about President Nixon. So that might fall within the zone of contributing to delinquency because delinquency of a minor is really whatever the parent or guardian doesn't want them to do. Yeah. So you might – but, but it, it – if they report stuff, what's the problem? If there's if there's no law broken, what where's the problem? You you should be all in favor of this. I I am in favor if you haven't crossed the line and they're just using because there's too many there's too many messages going by for anybody to actually read them. So they're just using this to 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 weed out the the wheat from the chaff is the other expression. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registrymatters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. Let's move over to an article from The Appeal. Georgia to execute a man for a crime that no longer gets the death penalty? I gotta think, Larry, that if you get convicted of a crime back in the year 111 when you were born, and somewhere in there, they have decided to change the law that would not have you uh, being uh, prosecuted under the death penalty. It just seems humane that we wouldn't then pursue the death penalty after the fact. Like, you know, hey, oh, I understand that you got sentenced to death, but today you wouldn't get sentenced to death. So we'll let that one slide and you'll just get life without parole. It just seems a more humane thing to do, but not here in Georgia. Well, the, the, see, and therein lies the nuance so where I'm going to come at it from a different angle than what you would expect. It is, it was the judgment of the court, and it was the order. So the people who are in charge of executing the orders in the sense of the court, you're opening up a Pandora's box if they say, well, it, 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 yeah, well, it shouldn't be that much time. So uh, under today's law, they would have only gotten uh, 30 days. Under yesterday's law, they got two years. So I'm going to unilaterally decide to open the floodgate and let that person out. That's not the way the system works. At the time, the death penalty was 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 uh, the penalty for that crime, and he was sentenced to death. Now, this 
th this illuminates the need when when you when you reduce penalties to actually deal with what happens with the people who have previously been convicted, which no one wants to touch that because it's complicated and requires a lot of administration to figure out and to undo convictions. Like if you if you downgrade something from a misdemeanor from a felony to a misdemeanor, then you've got all these people who are convicted felons that wouldn't be convicted felons today. Well, the state of Georgia, when they did this, all they had to have done was to say that anyone who was previously sentenced, uh, that, that those sentences would be automatically converted. They could have put that into statute. They didn't. So we, we assume that legislators know what they're doing, that they know the ramifications of their actions, just like when they reduce the penalty that, uh, that the, that the, uh, of uh, uh, the proximity and age. There was a high-profile case from uh, Georgia, from G Gennaro Wilson was his name. And he'd had sex with a with a girl, consensual sex, and they gave him a whole bunch of prison time, eight or ten years, and then they changed that because they were close enough in age. They made it a misdemeanor where he could, where a person could get no more than a year in jail. All right. And and they didn't want to release all the people who had previously been convicted, but they did release uh, General Wilson and and Thurbert Baker, who was the Attorney General of Georgia at the time. He said, "It's my job," and I swore that I was going to do my job, and these people were sentenced, and I am going to make sure that they stay in prison until they've served all their time. That's what Mr. Baker said. And uh, so I, I think that we would probably need to fault. We, we've got fault and we've got credit. The fault is the legislature for not doing doing the job thoroughly, and the credit goes to a system in Georgia that very few sta states have. Georgia has a politically insulated board of pardons and paroles. If this had had to go through the chief executive of the state, Brian Kemp would not have granted this. What ultimately happened was the execution was scheduled for Thursday night. And the Georgia Board of Pardons and Paroles, which operates in secret and is accountable only to themselves, they decided that this was not right, and they decided to exercise their executive functions, and they granted him clemency and converted him to life in prison. But if Georgia had the, uh, had the citizens where the citizens could have weighed in on this, I just about bet you the, for the, that the, uh, the public opinion in Georgia would be that this man, by golly, he was sentenced to that death, and he ought to have paid his uh, price for his crime. But that secret board of pardons and paroles conducted a hearing and decided to commute a sentence. Brian in chat asks, isn't there a general legal principle that if a law lessens a punishment for a crime that anyone sentenced under that crime have a right to request resentencing? No such principle I'm aware of. That was the whole fight about Obama's administration when they reduced the crack uh, uh, cocaine disparity and all these people are in federal prison for, for, for long periods of time for the, for the crack and the, and the, the uh, cocaine prisoners were, were, were not serving such long sentences and Obama had to commute and had to reduce their sentences, uh, and, and he engaged the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers to put together clemency packages, asking for uh, he his his attorney general encouraged clemency packages so I can give these people the relief because the law didn't do that. So you're just done it for it, it. You got to you got to get a lawyer to get yourself resentenced. Uh, well, you don't get yourself resentenced. Obama gave the people clemency that were convicted on that if they had served as much time as would have been required by the new law, they were eligible for clemency had they behaved themselves in prison. And they were some, there were some criteria. That's why he needed the application packets, and that's why that they sought the NACDL's assistance so that they could so that they could get those people out of prison. That's one thing that led to a significant reduction in the federal prison population while he was president. The first time in forty years, I might add, that the federal prison population went down was during the uh, during the second term of uh, President Obama. But that's neither here nor there. But but no, there's no principle I'm aware of that says if the crimes are reduced, unless they're specifically crimes, the uh, statutory changes are presumed to be prospective in enforcement, not not retroactive. So it works both ways. When when there's when there's uh, and we're trying to have it both ways here. We're trying to say you can't impose anything retroactively, and that's what the ex post facto clause does prevent. But a law doesn't automatically. If it's less than the penalty, it's not presumed to be retroactive unless it's specified that it's to be retroactive. And they don't do that because of the complexity. You've got 26,000 people in prison that did the same thing. They don't want to go through all the work of unraveling all those people. <laughs> that is true. And it would be uh, – uh, but just just from the, the difference of 
death or not death, which would be a very, very small number of people. But I get your point. That, that, that would be far fewer. Yes, you would have far fewer people in Georgia. It'd be interesting to see the specifics of how many people were sentenced under the old law to, to death that are still alive and haven't been executed. Because Georgia does a pretty good job of executing people. Uh, yeah, they you know, they're in the top challenges they're, with it. Yeah, yeah, they're in the top five. Uh, but but it would be interesting to see. But like when 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 you change this this criminal justice reform, it's one of the battles we're going to fight. And when on the off chance that something is reduced from a felony to a misdemeanor because lawmakers are beginning to recognize the the felony st- status, what that does to you for the rest of your life, trying to figure out how you would undo all those felony convictions that happened for the last several decades. I mean, some that would be dead, it wouldn't matter. I doubt that. I, I doubt that very many states would come forward and say, "I want to clear my father's name because he wasn't no convicted felon after this change." But the people that are still alive, will, I mean, that would be a, 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 a significant undertaking to, to to change all the records to reflect that that was a misdemeanor. We can't be doing all that. <laughs> Let's move over to this uh, news journal online. Uh, This one is super quick, and I just want to get your take on it uh, because it's just buried in the middle of it. But it says, uh, Representative Tom Leake of uh, Ormond uh, Beach's bill is seeking to prohibit bail for certain sex offenders was filed in October, just days after Volusia County judge reversed his earlier decision to grant uh, Mark Fugler release a $200,000 bail. The release of the former Embry Riddle, aeronautical university professor and sex offender, while his 15 year prison sentence was under review, generated harsh criticism from many, including Sheriff Mike Chitwood. So, is that common that just like one class of crime would be ineligible for bail? Uh, well, let's, let's just put this in the uh, context. This, this individual, Fugler, was convicted of several counts, and the the uh, 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 and uh, they they pronounce that Volusia, but the the, oh, the, the, the judge the judge the judge granted him an appeal bond because that's within the purview of of a trial court. Now the legislators have been trying to take that away from us as well because the B two movement says that a person once they're convicted should never breathe air again, and despite the fact that there might be a legitimate issues on appeal, they need to be sitting in that jail cell while they're appealing. So uh, so, uh, so, a, an appeal bond or a supersedious bond, they're becoming, have become very rare. But this judge had the audacity to grant a bond, but it, it didn't sit very well with the sheriff. So he went on a campaign uh, blasting the judge, and judges got elected in Florida, and the state filed a motion to reconsider, which I've got that in the show notes. On, uh, uh, but the the the, uh, the re- reconsideration was granted, and his his appeal bond was revoked. But but the down the the real consequences are because of the high profile nature of this. Florida is going to put a restriction in the law that that doesn't give judges the limited power. It takes away the limited power they have to grant a supersedious bond. And and there are legitimate reasons why people – I mean, our court system is not perfect. And some people that have the wherewithal would appeal just because they have the ability to appeal. But some people who are appealing feel like they have come up short on due process at some stage of the process that, they, that, 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 that egregious mistakes were made. And some people just say, I'm straight out innocent. <laughs> I, I, I want to appeal. So you got to appeal from prison as, as the way this is headed. That seems like that makes it much harder. <laughs> it makes it far harder when you're appealing from prison. and uh, But that's, like I say, that's also driven by the Me Too movement. The victim's advocacy, the victim's industrial complex doesn't want anybody to have due process. They don't want anybody to have appellate review. They don't want anyone to have habeas corpus review. They want you just to go ahead, say guilty, or they're going to or they're going to find you guilty anyway. But they want you just to go ahead, go away, and 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 rot in prison. And then when you come out, if you manage to get out, they want to hound you for the rest of your life with additional punishment that was not a part of the sentence. They want to continue to stack registry requirements. They're constantly lobbying for more and more restrictions that weren't a part of the sentence. They're always wanting to insert themselves into any removal process you get from the registry. If the, if the state provides a removal process, they demand to be heard. Of course, the, the registry is not supposed to be a part of your punishment, but somehow they've decided that it's their inheritance 
their right to be heard on that. I mean, it, 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 we're headed towards where due process is going to be nothing. Yeah, um, are you, are you, you seem to have gotten back up on the soapbox. I did. Are you off? Okay. I'm off. <laughs> people, are, people are sick of hearing me. Yeah, or they're also sick, right? They could be sick, but I think they're <laughs> sick of hearing me. That's why, that's why our numbers are going up. They are growing up, Larry. Mm-hmm. I, will, I will attest to that they are growing. Now, as I was saying, uh, drugs are bad. You shouldn't do drugs. Uh, if you do them, you're bad because drugs are bad. Okay, it's a bad thing to do drugs, so, so don't be bad by doing drugs. Okay, that'd be bad. But drugs are bad. Okay. From the Marshall Project, people on probation and parole are being denied perfectly legal medical weed, despite statewide legislation or legalization. Some counties ban probationers and parolees from using medical marijuana. So the chronically ill turn to less effective and more addictive prescription drugs. Just before we even go into anything, alcohol is perfectly legal to drink me as a much older adult male at this point in time in my life. But my handlers say I can't drink it. What am I supposed to do about that? So doesn't this sort of fit into the same area? Well, it does. And they're taking a slightly different tack. They're saying... And they're, they're right about this as much as I hate to give them credit for being right because generally they're not. But if you look at your, uh, at your conditions of your supervision, almost everyone out there, if you pull your conditions, it'll say uh, comply with all state, federal, and local laws. So they're taking the position that since it's still against the law federally, that we can in good conscience allow you to break the federal law. I mean, we're supposed to be holding you accountable to the law, not encouraging you to break the law. I mean, you have to you have to give them credit for that. They are they are doing what the, they're following the letter of that JNS. If it says uh, 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 obey all state and federal laws, what are they supposed to do? Say, well, only the federal laws that we agree with. That is true. So we don't disagree with. Except for when this crosses the line, that the uh, couple people that they profile in this article have gotten prescriptions from doctors, say you know for for things like seizures or chronic pain, and. Maybe they rub some of the CBD oil around their lips or, or like on their gums and it helps them not have seizures or have reduced pain so that they can function. I would call it an asshole move that they say, nope, sorry, we're going to lock you up if you test positive for dope because of this. Well, what this is going to do is this, this is going to be litigated and we're going to have a body of case law develop. It's going to take some time, but we're going to have a body of case law. There's two ways this could be solved. We could put pressure on Congress to take this off the Schedule 1 narcotics list. And that is something that I wish the Trump administration would do because they would be they would be in the best position to do it. Anything that the Democrats try to do is vilified because they're trying to turn loose a tidal wave of criminality on the citizens. But if the Trump administration would take the lead on this, they would not get vilified. I promise you, if you can find a Democrat that will vilify them for trying to legalize and take uh, marijuana off the uh, Schedule One list, I would be so shocked. I'd almost offer you a thousand dollars to do that. But so, so th- 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 they they could take the lead on doing this. That would be one way to to get it off the schedule for the Trump administration to say, look, Congress, please remove this. And Congress would, 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 being that Trump owns the Republican Party and the Democrats are for it anyway, this would be a unanimous thing that would be easy to do. And, and there'd be that no would vilification. be bipartisan support. Yes, there would be bipartisan support. So that'd be one thing that could be done. The other thing, in the absence of that, which if the Trump administration doesn't lead the way, then will be litigation. What will have to have happen is that we'll have to have people argue that this is a government intrusion in a legitimate area of medical practice where where that where that the government is depriving the doctor of their uh, but with the doctor patient relationship and the conservatives claim they're all about that doctor patient relationship uh, you know they respected that when they were having all the debate about the affordable care act and about how they wanted to preserve the 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 the, the decision between the doctor and the patient and how so so that's what's going to have to happen if if it's not removed from the schedule then we're going to have to have litigation, and it's going to take. We're going to have inconsistent decisions. The Alabama Supreme Court is going to say it's okay for probation to do this because it's a violation of federal law, and the uh, Michigan Supreme Court is going to say it's not okay because it interferes with the doctor and the patient's relationship, and it's the state deciding medical care. And we're going to have decisions all over the map, but that's what it's going to take to change this. That sounds just like same-sex marriage. That's exactly what's going to happen. And eventually, a few years out, it may make its way to the U.S. US Supreme Court and we'll get some guidance or hopefully public policy will change. 
if all the people listening to us, which there's now, what, about 56,000? <laughs> yeah, plus or minus <laughs> a few here or there. <laughs> if all the people listening to us would call their representatives to serve them in Congress and say, look, why are we still scheduling marijuana as a, as a narcotic? Why, why are we doing that when 30-some-odd states have made it legal for, for medical? I, I will just put a pin in there that the guy that we voted to be president put an attorney general in there says that, you know, marijuana is a gateway drug to all the bad things. Well, that attorney general is no, no longer there. I don't know. I don't know what Barr's opinion is, but that, that one's no longer there. But, uh, but Trump, ha- Trump has a lot of political capital and he could burn a little bit of it on this issue if he chose to. Doesn't even seem like he would have to burn it. He would have almost everybody on board with him to begin with. He would. They'd probably be the Tom Cottons. There'd be some people that from, from deeply conservative states would say, I ain't going to have no part of this, Mr. President. I support you, but I can't do it on this. And we're going to have to just agree to disagree. But it would be very minimal opposition. I do understand. Anyway, I just think that, that as you were just saying, to call your local representative and tell them this, I think that we the people are very poopy for making it so that people that have medical conditions that uh, weed can fix, it is still not legal for you to get weed to fix it. I think that is just an atrocious abomination of how we treat humans in this country. Just my opinion. I agree. I agree with that opinion. I I, I never thought I'd come around to this, but now that at this age, when you get as old as I am, when you when you find the pains of life, and you find so many testimonials about how how that they're able to live with pain management far better than what the pharmaceutical garbage. Uh, yeah. uh, that, 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 that they can manage their pain and, and have a quality of life. I've certainly come around to seeing the light. And, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's sad that here we still are in 2020 with this as a scheduled drug where people can be put in federal prison for a little bit of marijuana. Now, there's truthfully probably not very many people in federal prison for just possession. They, they don't prosecute those type of cases, but the potential is there. Yeah. And I mean, there's certain, you know, in the states where it is, you can't smoke it here, you can get the oil and stuff here finally. And let's not forget that our neighbors to the north just said, let's just make it all legal. Not all of it, but all of the marijuana legal. So it's across all of Canada. It's legal up there. That just happened yeah. very recently, handful of months, I think. Yeah, I think we talked about it on the podcast. We very well may have. Did you know that this Reason article was coming out? Because I, it just showed up and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool with uh, profiling some women from the movement? I did not know about it, but it's a lengthy read, but it, it, it's very good. It is very good. So it profiles uh, Sandy, uh, who is part of Narsal, and then Janice Bellucci out there in California, and then uh, Vicky from War, which is the Women Against the Registry. It is a very lengthy read, and it, I think Janice is the only one in there that doesn't come to the issue by like a family member. Like She was just like, well, my friend forever ended up committing a crime a hundred years ago and now he's dragged into all this registry stuff. So she decided to pull her legal expertise to, to try and help and go for a low hanging fruit where things are crappy in California with like resident, not residents presence and uh, Halloween kind of things that they, we did in Georgia here recently. So yeah, it was a That's good article. Correct. I just wanted to bring everybody's attention to it. Uh, it's a, it, it was on the front page of reason on the website that I uh, saw it. Great article. All right, and then to close it out, Larry, I have a super duper fun little audio clip to play, and uh, we can uh, we can beat it around for a minute about hypocrisy. I just want to personally and publicly go on record supporting this resolution before us this evening. You know, guys, it's it's simple. Like a lot of them have said, the Constitution needs no no explanation. It's been enforced for several hundred years now. It's easy to understand. It says what it means, and means what it says. And the last time I read the Declaration of Independence, it, it, it specifically reminds all of us that we're endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, which means God-given, among these life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and that governments were instituted among men specifically to secure our God-given rights. And it says when government becomes destructive to these ends, meaning when they go above and beyond trying to secure our liberties and trying to take them, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish that government, either by voting or ultimately, God forbid, to use our Second Amendment rights to protect ourselves from tyranny. And I'm just asking all of y'all to unanimously join our sister counties of Wilkes, Surrey, Stokes, Lincoln, and Cherokee 
and get on board with this thing and publicly demonstrate to us that you're willing to uphold and honor the same oath I took when I put my hand on God's word and held my other hand up to him and swore that I'd give my life to defend that Constitution. And I, and I hate, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but regardless of what y'all do or don't do, I'm not going to enforce an unconstitutional law. I'm going to So I think that comes on the heels of some sort of um, movement to, to create some gun control pull back on people having weapons and whatnot. But he's sitting there as the sheriff of that county saying he is not going to enforce an unconstitutional law. And I would really like that same sheriff to go, well, I'm not going to enforce these laws against these registrants who, you know, post their supervision. They should have all their rights restored. I'm not going to enforce them. I think that's a great point. It, it begs the real question that, I mean, he, he, he mentioned the book and he's talking about the Bible. But he put his hand on the Bible and said he would enforce the laws and all laws, uh, even unconstitutional ones, until they're declared so by a court. He put his hand on the Bible and said he was going to enforce that law. Now, if he can't do that in good faith, he should resign from office. But it is his job to enforce the laws. And they're presumed constitutional and they're only unconstitutional once the courts have said so. So it's not for him to unilaterally decide that anything that's passed in that area is unconstitutional. We can we can we can fill this air with with uh, quotes from Scalia saying that 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 there's no absolute right for all guns in all circumstances. He's acknowledged that there can be controls. There already are controls. That the the the, the felon prohibition and, and additional prohibitions are already controls. And he had, has admitted that. You can't own any type of weapon. He he doesn't know where the he didn't know where the boundaries would be, but he admitted there's going to be. So this this sheriff is just plain out wrong. I mean he's 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 being a hypocrite, but he's just plain out wrong. <laughs> His job is to enforce the law until the courts proscribe that it's not constitutional. That's his and, job. And if I may try and put a finer point on that, as as I understand it, so I'm going to speak in in dumb people terms that I understand. We we have judges that don't legislate or execute. We have legislators that don't uh, adjudicate or execute, and we shouldn't have uh, the executive branch judging or legislating. So the sheriff should just say, hey, it's illegal to run this red light. I believe you ran the red light. We're going to go through the process to figure out if you ran the red light and, and cite you and all that stuff. He doesn't get to interpret the law. Is that is that the right way to understand that? Well, that's that's what I'm saying. He doesn't uh, now. He can prioritize and alloc- uh, allocate his resources, and, and if he doesn't want to make that a high priority, I have no problem with that. If he says, "Well, you know, you people passed it, but that's fine. I don't have the manpower, and I'm not going to go out and try to find the manpower, and we're not going to be looking for guns to confiscate. It's not going to be a high priority for us. But if it happens to fall in our lap, we'll enforce it. But for him to proclaim it's unconstitutional, he doesn't get to do that, and that's what he's doing. I understand. I'm glad that you pointed that out to me when I brought it up to you this morning, because I was like, hey, that's hypocrisy. We need to talk it about is, that. It is definitely hypocrisy. And, and the, that, that same group of people was criticizing Obama when he was in the office of the president, and he chose for his administration, Department of Justice, to no longer defend the the uh, the, the DOMA, as it was known, the Defense of Marriage Act, which was, was the prohibition of same-sex marriage. And the Sean Handy crowd, I could probably dig up some quotes where they said, well, President Obama has unilaterally decided that he's the interpreter of the Constitution, and he's just not even going to show up in court to argue to defend the laws, which his Department of Justice is obligated to do. Now, it's amazing how that when it's something that you uh, disagree with, which a lot of conservatives were not in favor of, of same-sex marriage, they thought they thought it was an abomination when person said, I'm, I'm not going to fight this anymore. I'm just going to acquiesce that, that it's unconstitutional. But magically now, those same people are, did you hear the cheers going up in that room when he said, I oh, won't totally. enforce the law? Absolutely. <laughs> and all of them were, you know, NRA wearing, you know, gun-toting people and all that. So that's, that's also hypocrisy. Yes. Well, I, anyway, I just want to bring it up because it, it caught my attention this morning when I was looking through Twitter. And then uh, the last thing that we have is you brought this up five minutes before the show. Mother Jones and Florida Supreme Court says ex-felons must pay fines before regaining their vote. So this is on the heels of them doing their their state constitution amendment number four, I think it was, where they allowed felons to vote. 
And that, tell me what the law reads. Well, the reason why I brought this in is because there was a little bit of hypocrisy on my part because I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand the amendment. I mean, th- th- we we cover stuff from all the states, and we 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 just don't have enough time to do the the depth on on every article that that would really do justice. So they when the voters passed the constitutional amendment, I did not realize that it had been worded the way it was, and there had been a hearing that there had been challenges to the actual the amendment being placed on the ballot. And, and the, 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 uh, uh, before it went to the voters in 2018, there was litigation because there, was, there were people who said it was confusing in terms of what the amendment provided for. Well, it turns out that the governor DeSantis did not know what the, what, what, where it was because in 2019, the legislature passed a law saying that you had to pay all your fines and fees and the economic part of your sentence to, to, to be eligible to be, to be restored. And I was a bit critical. I said, well, there they go again. I mean, they're, they're, they just have this great fear that, that, that these people that have convictions, these felons, they're going to somehow go out and vote liberal. And, and I, I, I saw it through partisan eyes. Now I look at this decision. Now this is an advisory opinion and courts are very rare to, to give advisory opinions, but in, in Florida, since 1968, they they note in the opinion here that they that they've offered advisory opinions in rare situations for 50 plus years. And the governor asked, "Hey, we've got this amendment, and we've got this statute that requires people to have their fines and fees paid." And so they looked at it and they said, "Well, actually, that's exactly what it meant because it says what it means, and we we are literally interpreting the words, and it says all." And 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 and, uh, and what does what does all terms mean? And last time I checked, it means everything. So so they say that since the word all is in there, completion of all terms, that all would include not only the duration of your sentence, but all things within the four corners of the sentence, including the fines and restitution. So they're saying we're strict, we are textualist. We look at this, and all means all. So therefore, I have to say that I was wrong because I thought this was politically motivated. This is just nothing more than just strict construction, going by the statute, being a textualist. And if that's the type of justices that the people elect, I think they elect their Supreme Court by popular vote. But if that's the type of justices they put on the Supreme Court, this is a very rational interpretation. Because all means what it says. It's kind of like you are a person, right? You did travel to uh, Nebraska, didn't you? (laughs) <laughs> you did that's have to register in Colorado, didn't you? I mean, why are we here? Well, that's what this advisory opinion is saying, that, that, that they're looking at this, and it says what it says, and, and there's, they don't see the ambiguity. All right, then. I got nothing for it. So well, I have, I, I, have, I have uh, – it's a 20-page opinion. There's a, there's, there's a lot of notes made throughout there for those, for those legal beagles who like to – who like to uh, uh, think of themselves as textualists? Look at this. This is a fine example sample of textual interpretation. <laughs> so, All right, uh, go read the show notes over at registrymatters.co. There will be a link to the uh, that you can pull it from our site with Larry's fine highlights. Now, for our final segment, Larry, we are going to continue traveling down the path of becoming the most awesomest person to go to your legislator and make all the changes necessary from where where people have traffic lights all the way through where bridges are going to be built and then all the way of course to taking down the registry in your neighborhood my first question to you is how do you find what is going on in the legislature how do you find the calendar for even like when you should be paying attention to anything to be paying attention to I don't like where would someone begin at trying to like quote unquote watch a bill? Well, I would I would assume every state I've gone to looking for the legislative website, they all have something that, that approximates a, a a website and some are more user friendly than others, but you would start by knowing when your legislature is in session. And so you go look on they probably have a tab called calendar. So you'd look on find out the session dates, they'll either be called calendar or session dates and find out if they're in session. So that's how you find that's how you find out that they're that they're meeting. Like in Wyoming, they meet 15 days one year and 30 days the next uh, every other year. And in my state, they meet uh, 30 days one year, 60 days the next year. Interesting. So so, so uh, they're is not. Is there in, a rationale behind that? 
the rationale is that that the uh, people need to get in, get out, and get the work done quickly. Okay. And when it's statehood at the time, uh, the state was uh, admitted 107 or eight years ago. There was a uh, uh, a lot smaller population issues weren't as complex, and that's what the constitution set up, and it hasn't been changed. And that would be a constitutional change to bring him in for a sixty and ninety day session on opposite years, something like that. It'd be a constitutional change. We're fixed in the constitution for for our length of our sessions. Now that doesn't preclude special sessions, okay, which can be called by the legislature themselves, and they, or they can be called by the executive. The legislature has to have three quarters of the legislators uh, calling for an extraordinary session. The only way they can come into session, but the governor can call a special session practically at any time. And are you speaking specifically for for your state, or pretty much all of in, them? In my state, in my state. Well, special sessions are provided for in every state that I've looked at. The mechanisms where the legislators can call themselves into session, I don't know about those provisions, but uh, I've, I've not known of a, of a chief executive who could not call the legislature into session. I, I've not run across that. So the, I yeah, think I mean, it'd be safe to say uh, a governor can have a, have something where they need the, the legislature, the legislators to be in session. Let me ask you this. I it seems that this is roughly the time of year that everybody, unless it's a year-round legislature, but the part-time ones, this seems to be the time of year that they're all doing their things. Is is that consistent, or does somebody do it at the end of the summer? No, this is very consistent. They they generally, uh, most states are on a fiscal year cycle, which runs uh, July 1st through June 30th. The so federal government used to be on that same cycle until 1975, but they were on the, the same fiscal cycle, but they just couldn't get the uh, budget done in time. So they went to the September, I mean, the October 1st through uh, September 30th, and they still don't get the budget done. So you hear all these continuing resolutions yes. and all these catch-all spending bills because they just can't, they can't adopt the 13 or 14 different agency appropriations and get them done in time. So, so uh, but yeah, it's pretty common that they would be, they'd be in session early in the year. And okay, so now that you've identified the calendar, uh, and, you know, and I wrote down a handful of questions. And by all means, you should you should lead the way. I just am trying to 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 fish out what I think is important. Is is after you know what the calendar is, it seems like even before that, maybe you want to know what the bills are to then have a reason to go look at the calendar. Which way would you do it to see to what would be the most logical flow? Well, if you were looking at my legislature, you would look at the. You look at those. There's a tab called Bill Finder, mm-hmm. and you can look at you can look at the the bills. Now they're 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 titled and they have numbers, so they'll have uh, they'll have uh, start at House Bill One, amazingly, and <laughs> many legislators are allowing legislatures are allowing pre-filing now. So it means before they're even gavel in, they can pre-file a bill. It doesn't do anything other than just it lets the public know it's out there. In the old days, before we had pre-filing. You did not know what was going to happen until they gaveled in. That's when you could introduce a bill, but now you can pre-file. So, like, if you were to go to our – when I went yesterday, we had, like, 189 House bills already pre-filed and, like, 112 Senate bills already pre-filed. So, you go – you can you can scroll through them looking at the title. If the title interests you, then you can click on the, the bill, and it'll print you up a PDF or a text copy of, of, of the bill. And – then there's keyword searches. You can start putting in keywords. Well, a lot of our audience is going to be interested in sex offenders, so you put in that as, as keywords. But that's not the only word you'd want to put in. I mean, you would want to put in probation, parole, assault, uh, you know, any number of any keywords you can think of that might appear in a bill. You put it in, and it'll bring up bills that have those words somewhere in them. And and uh, you may find something that that you missed when you did your your title search when you were looking at the bills by title. When you do when you do probation, you may find something that didn't pop up, or you look at aggravated because they might be wanting to change the level of an offense to an aggravated. So you just put the word in aggravated, see what pops up, right? And and, and click on that bill. So that what was uh, you, my you 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 preempted my question of like what would be terms. So obviously, sec- sexual offense would be. One of the terms that would be one, but like I say, you could just you could just start throwing words out there. Uh, like I just went through a litany of words you can throw in to your keyword search. Yeah, and um, I'm just trying to it, help build a, a, a some sort of little uh, uh, roster of words that people might be able to use to to help. Well, outside of what well, would be obvious, probation, parole, violent, aggravated. Okay, uh, sexual, right? Uh, 
uh, and you know, when you do, do find those, now you're faced with reading a hundred pages or twenty pages or however long the bill is. You've got to go read it, and they're written in legalese, aren't they? Not really, some in some cases. But you in state legislatures, you typically don't have those lengthy bills like you do in the federal system. You would find a bill that could be anywhere from a couple three pages up to thirty pages, forty pages. But it's not the hundreds and hundreds of bill of pages you see in the federal system. So, so I mean, no one it serves in, not a soul uh, serves in Congress reads those bills. And they're lying to you if they tell you they do. Uh, they don't. They, they, they don't. It's, it's not. It's not practical to have a eleven hundred piece of leg- a page piece of legislation and actually read that. Uh, yeah, I know yeah. that that came up during the uh, the Obamacare thing, and then I guess um, I'm trying. What was the big piece of legislation that everyone was bitching about? That you know, it was two thousand pages long that nobody read. I don't remember what that well, one was. Well, the, the Affordable Affordable Care Act was the big was a big one, but it happens all the time with with sure. these appropriations, with these big uh, mammoth uh, catch all spending bills. There are many hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of stuff tucked into those bills. Nobody nobody reads Maybe them. Maybe it was yeah, the tax could, bill. Probably. Yeah, uh, I mean that I sounds think like was, the the most recent biggest piece of legislation that would have gone through at the federal level. Um, and and no one no one read that. Of course not. And so I, I want to say that there was a quote somewhere along the way it, it, either one of those two is like, well, how are we going to find out about this? Like, well, we'll find out about it when it happens and someone challenges it. No one knows what's in there. That, that is correct. And <laughs> so it's sad, but that's the reality. That is the reality of a, a complex world we live in today. We're yeah. not living in the 1780s. <laughs> so government right, is so- far larger, doing far more things. And when you find a bill that says it's going to do all the terrible things to all of our people, what are you would want to know, or would you want to know where it is in the process? How many co-sponsors uh, has it been signed? Has it been voted on? Is it in committee? Can you shed some light on all of those different things? Well, you're, you're certainly going to want to know the, the posture of the legislation right now in our state. Everything's in, in the pre-file, and, it, and it'll stay there until. The earliest end they can move would be Tuesday at noon when they gavel in. Nothing will move on Tuesday, and nothing will move for several days because, in order for anything to move in a thirty-day session, it has to be germane to to to, to either the budget or it has to be specifically re- requested by the governor. So it has to have an executive message. So they have a committee's committee and both the House and the Senate that that that, that they go through a germanity test to see if there uh, if there's a if there's an executive message for the legislation. So. Before things start cranking out, they have to be determined to be germane. And, and, and then and this is not the case in Pennsylvania. It's not the case. So I'm only speaking from state where I have the most experience. So, so in our 30-day session, they'll be going through the committee's committee to find out if, if they're germane to the session. And then at, the, at that point, when they're determined germane, they'll be released to their, to their next committee assignments, which will be at least two more committees. We run everything through two committees. So when you look at the, at the code system they have, they'll tell you what committees it's been assigned to. And that's and where the action purposes, is. Mostly, they're on the judicial committee, or you know, something like that. Well, and, justice and, committee. And and in our particular state, we have we have the bulk of things going through public affairs in the House. And we have a public affairs in the Senate, and we have a judiciary in the House, judiciary in the Senate. So, if it's the House bill, it's going to get go through 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 the through the ger- germanity test, if I can pronounce that right, and then it's going to go to the to the public affairs committee, as it's called, the consumer. A House Consumer and Public Affairs Committee, and then it's going to go to the Judiciary Committee, and then it's going to go to the floor. But you can see at any given time where it is, and you can you can pull that committee's schedule and see if that bill is on it. Now, those who whine and whine about they didn't notify me of anything, now let me just tell you how we used to have to find out what was on the calendar. <laughs> I was going to ask you about this. <laughs> yeah, we well, the way we used to find out what was on the calendar was you would drive yourself to the Capitol before we had the internet, and you would ask for the daily uh, daily bill tracker. And and you looked at the bill tracker to see where things were. And then when you saw what committee it was in, you would go to the committee office to the, to, and see if it was on that day's agenda. And then you would get in suite with the committee staff and try to see if it was going to be on the next committee meeting. And so the, if that's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday committee, and it's not on, uh, on, on the Wednesday, you're going to ask, well, do you think this is going to be on Friday? And they're going to say, we don't know. So then you would say, well, would you mind if I call you back on Friday to ask you? Because I don't live in Santa Fe. And I don't want to come up here. So then you would call the committee secretary and say, is that on the calendar today? 
And they would say, no, it isn't. And then you would say, thank you. That's the way we used to have to do it. And the people gripe about the, the I mean, the information's now at your fingertips of it's what we used to have a get, really hard time. No, yes, it's really. As you, as it's you really, said earlier, there's no <laughs> sacrifice in getting it. There's absolutely no effort. Now, as the session goes into the waning days, things move really, really fast here. Really fast. Because you've got hundreds of bills and you've got a short period of time to cover them. And if a bill has made it through a substantial part of the process, it only has one committee to go, and then it would have to go to, the, to that chamber. So let's say a House bill has made it through the, through the three committees it's going to go through because of the germane test. And then it's made it to the House floor and it's been approved. Then it's made it to the Senate, Senate, and it's made it through one of the two committees. Then every bill that's in that posture that has one committee to go, the, the sponsors of those bills are begging for hearing time. They're begging that chair to please schedule my bill. And everybody is doing the same thing. Can I get on the calendar? We've only got two more. There's, there's only two more meetings of the, of the Judiciary Committee. Will you hear my bill, please, Madam Chairman, Mr. Chairman? Will you hear my bill? And they've got all, all these people knocking at the door want their bills heard. And you just can't get to all of them. So somebody has to be told, no, sorry, your bill's not going to get a hearing. Sorry, you know, we've got, we've, we're, Here's what we're going to hear, and that's the power that a chair has. So getting to, getting to to be in good with a chair helps you a lot on knowing what's going to happen. Because if you have a relationship with the chair, the chair will tell you. In, in our case, most of the time, we're wanting bills not to be heard. We're in the killing business, and I, I yeah, dare and say most uh, most advocates across the country they're in the killing business. They're not in the passing business. Yeah, we're we're not in the business of making things better yet. We're we're still in the business of trying to keep things from getting worse. That is correct. Now, ideally, we'd like to be in the passing business, but right now, that's just not the reality of the situation. You're in the killing business. So your job as a beginner is to figure out how to kill and slow down bad stuff to wreck the train so it doesn't make it to the finish line. If it doesn't get to the finish line, the governor can't sign it. And can we, can we delve into that? You've, you've told me miscellaneous stories about you having the relationship, and, and obviously most of our people don't have those kinds of relationships, but you can pull strings with people, and I don't want to throw you under the bus if you don't want to talk about something with any level of detail, but hey, I don't want this Apple bill to go through, so can you put it on the bottom of the stack? And then maybe they run out of time for the day, and then, hey, sorry, it didn't get to be heard because it was on the bottom of the stack. Well, it's not quite that overt. Uh, you, you, there's a lot more integrity in the, the process than that. What, what, what you would what you would do is you would tell the chair if you have the relationship, there's some serious problems with this bill, and you give them a couple of things that are problems, and you tell them it needs further analysis, and then they, the committees have a, have analysts, so you get them you get them to agree that they need to, to to have more analysis done on the bill before they schedule it, and then that few days that, that it takes to get the the, the analysis done may be enough to wreck the train because when analysis comes back, the chair may say, gee, yes, that, that I, I didn't know that. And I'm not going to prioritize this bill. It's not going anywhere. Uh, but yes, yeah, it's, it's not like just having a relationship and saying, I'll give you $500 to move this to the bottom of the stack. <laughs> no, but it's, I didn't but mean it's, it like that either. No, no, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> no, I hope I didn't come across that way. Um, in my, I compared a couple states. I just, I, I just used the term sexual offense. And one state had 17, and another state had like 250 bills pop up with that search term in it. That yeah, well, seems that would, that would that would not be for one session. That that would be going back for years and years and years. Nobody's got 200 bills in one session. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I I, yeah. I I thought that I was looking at it for only this current session. I thought, but I totally could be wrong with that. Yeah, I suspect. I mean, I think Brenda would be. If she's in chat. She could tell you the the first year she got in this business, they had they had dozens, but uh, but not hundreds. It was it was dozens of bills okay. that, that dealt with something to do with se sexual offense. Now, sexual offense is a pretty broad term. So, yeah. you, if you're if you're doing a, if you're doing a lot of criminal justice work, sexual offense can pop up. Sexual can pop up a lot. I mean, the, if you're amending criminal sexual penetration, criminal sexual contact, which are our two primary vehicles for charging people with sex crimes if you put sexual any legislation in there so if there's anything to deal do with deal with three strikes 
that would pop up. I mean, you 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 can get a lot a, a lot a lot of hits by putting it in key terms. This is not going to be so easy that someone's going to provide you a list of everything that might apply to you. If you're looking for that, you probably are in the wrong business. Uh, mm-hmm. You're going to have to do you're going to have to do some work. Uh, everything everything that 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 happens good in life re- generally requires a little bit of work unless you win the lottery of birth and you inherit it. But but this process is not totally without some effort. Okay. Yeah, you're right, though. So I'm looking at the Georgia one, and it does go back a couple years, 17 bills in the last handful of years. Back to 17 is what that goes. Okay. All right. I, you got it. You win. You are the master. I, the I always win. That's why I am here. Yes, that's why you're paid the big bucks, to be here. Yes, um, someone, someone, someone has to, hearing that, think it sounds arrogant. You have to watch the movie MacArthur, play, starring Gregory Peck from 1977. When, when when MacArthur and Roosevelt met, and MacArthur was uh, was uh, was a little bit on the arrogant side, and he was he was incensed that the president pulled him off of his command to meet with him because he was too busy running a war, and uh, and he asked he said, Mr. President, can I get back to my command? He said, I, I believe that a commander's place is at the scene of the scene of the battle, and uh, Roosevelt says, I agree, I agree with you entirely, Douglas. He said, that is why I am here. <laughs> Is there so, anything else that you think is important on this subject for this chapter of the Larry Teaches How to Lobby <laughs> class? I think that, that anybody who actually wants to know more could be more specific with questions. And so that way we're not going down a rabbit hole. We kind of we have an idea of where people are and what's most helpful. But the first thing really truly is to go to the website, figure out when your legislature is in session. Figure out what bills might pertain to your interest. It doesn't have to be about sexual stuff. It may be that you want the taxes to be cut in half. It yep. may be that, that 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 you want bridges to nowhere not to be built. It may be that you're interested in public health. Why would but you what want are your bridges to are? nowhere not to be built? Why would you want that? Well, they built them all over. Uh, that you know, know, that was a joke back, back, back in. Uh, I know there's one in Alaska. Ago. There was one by where my my parents live, and that I always thought that was funny. There was a bridge that like went halfway across the canal and like didn't finish on the other side. Okay. Well, but see, there again, see, things like that are taken out of context. When you, when you have a capital outlay process that sometimes takes years to complete, you seldom have enough money to do everything you want in one fell swoop because we, we don't, most, most states don't finance things on, 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 on the, the way they should. So we might have $180 million of capital outlay, which comes from a segment of our severance taxes. So we might have $180 million. Well, you may have a project. Your slice of that 180 million may be 2.4 million for your for, for your slice, and you may have a project that's going to cost 14 million. So therefore, you may start the project hoping that you're going to be able to procure additional ca- capital outlay in a future year, and you may run out of capital because the next year the economy tanks and uh, that amount of capital outlay dries up to to half that or a third that or some some cases no capital outlay. So it's it's like people who don't understand processes. All this stuff sounds conspiratorial and irresponsible until you actually get behind the scenes and figure out how it works. And, and 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 yes, there are sinister things that go on, and yes, things could be better done, but it's not as sinister as people believe. You know, I hear I hear criticisms that are just totally indicative of people who have no idea how things are funded and how things work, and it's easy to criticize when you don't understand something. It, that that's the case for all of us. Definitely. All right. Well, if you do have questions, uh, you could email crackpot at register. No, that's not really the email address. Uh, you could email registrymatterscast at gmail.com. And if it is of, I, I will forward it to Larry if it seems worthy. Uh, if you want to phone in a question, Larry, what's the phone number? Oh, that is the best way to contact us because we're, we're just going to disconnect the number next week if we don't get a call. It's 747 227 4477. Um, and then, of course, the show notes, or if you want to leave comments on the website, registrymatters.co. Larry, I have a new way for people for for an idea of how much people could contribute to the podcast if they are so inclined. And what is that? And what's the? It's what's tax the, season. People should know, sign think, up, sign us over their tax returns. I think you might be onto something here. So what? <laughs> now, now here's now here's the way they could do it when they when they're at H and R Block or their local tax preparer. We could provide them a special account number because the IRS doesn't care as long as the taxpayer wants it to go to that account. It doesn't have to have the taxpayer's number on it. It just has to be an account designated by the by the taxpayer. 
so they could they could designate a special account for their refund. That, how did, why didn't I think of that? I don't know. I was driving home last night. I was like, oh, I have an idea. It's tax season. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and we're both we're both being silly. But I hope so. I mean, uh, not but, really. But, yes, <laughs> uh, we're being, being silly. But but there are a lot of businesses that build a significant amount of their revenue project, projection and marketing into tax season. To how to separate you from your tax refund. I mean, so it's not. I imagine the car (laughs) business does that pretty, pretty uh, successfully. Uh, And they offer you tax refund anticipation loans, so that you can, so that you can go ahead and start spending that money. So it is, it is, it is bizarre, but, but yes, we appreciate every patron. I don't think we've been very complimentary enough, complimentary of our patrons in 2020 and 2020. Have have we? we? We should totally, totally, totally thank all of our patrons individually, one by one by one by one, and we will be saying 2,000 names. Well, that's, that's it's a little, little bit less than 2,000, but we're, we're growing. We are. We are going to, we're going to hit 100 this year, or we're going to sign off. Really? You're making yes. that hard claim? Yes. If we don't have 100 by this year, we're, we're closing up shop. All right, then. Well, Larry said it. So you got uh, about 350 days to get there. 345 days? <laughs> uh, we can do it, Andy. We can do it. I, I know we can. I know we can. Larry, we are, we are at an hour and 46 minutes, so we need to go. Let's get out of here. As always, Larry, thank you so very much. I appreciate your time, your knowledge, your expertise, your humor, and your, your knowledge from back before there was electricity and running water. Well, we didn't even have water, much less running water. <laughs> You were here before water. <laughs> you had to. You had to. You had to take a camel, and you had to <laughs> ask the camel if if the camel would share some water with you because there was no place else to get it. <laughs> All right, Larry. I gotta go. Talk to you later. <laughs> Bye.